Ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to have today's guest on the show. This gentleman is a former Air Force pilot turned Bitcoin guru. He started stacking sats and teaching the public about Bitcoin well before the masses and was way ahead of the curve. Present day, he's the founder of 99 Bitcoins, which started out as a personal blog about Bitcoin and today is now one of the largest online sources for cryptocurrency tutorials, reviews, guides, which millions of readers follow every single month. I'm very pleased to welcome to the Crypto News Podcast, Afir Bagel. Afir, welcome to the show. Hey, Matt. Very nice to be here. Very excited. Very fired up to have you on as well. You're you're definitely the first pilot on the show. I, I want to kick <laughs> off by, hey, you got to have some crazy stories about that. Like, how, how cool is that flying jets? Come on. Yeah, so actually, I, I don't fly jets. I fly helicopters, which is way more cool because <laughs> uh, instead of flying at 30,000 feet, you fly at like 25 feet, wow. which is like, you know, having like an ATV, but just uh, 25 feet above the ground. And it's pretty crazy, you know, just uh, flying so low level and and. It's probably one of the best things uh, um, I enjoy is, is flying helicopters in life. You still do that? Not as an active uh, pilot in the military. I stopped doing that a few years ago, but I do it uh, as a civilian. So I started flying also small airplanes, and, and, and basically I'm still flying small helicopters as well. Wow, that is absolutely bananas. That's uh, I've always loved to fly like a fighter jet, like you know me and Tom Cruise kind of thing. <laughs> flying a helicopter, that's pretty darn cool too. I've always seen flying a jet, by the way, flying it, it looks pretty cool. But once you do it, it's it's very nauseating. <laughs> really? From the, yeah, the one or two times I did it, I, I it didn't well, <laughs> I have to say. All, all of that G-force and stuff like that, it's 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 really tummy turning. I bet. Yeah. Well, you're you're ripping through altitude so quickly there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, very, very cool. Any any crazy stories for us from, uh, you know, rescuing people or anything like that? Well, it's pretty hectic in here, uh, as always. You know, um, I'm, I'm located in Israel right now, and it's pretty hectic, uh, the whole Israel situation always. So I do have some, you know, some combat stories back in the day of, you know, flying while people are, you know, firing uh, around you. But in general, it, at the end, it, it's, it's not, it's not, a, there's not a lot to write home about. You know, sometimes you have, first of all, because the whole situation is very sensitive. And it's not like you see in the movies. There's not like good, get good guys and bad guys. The end war, war sucks. And, 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 you know, it's, it, it isn't as glamorous as it looks, but I will say that there is something very, very fulfilling in being a part of a mission that it's, that its goal is to save someone's life. I, I flew Blackhawks. So basically we did search and rescue missions. We didn't do any bombing or stuff like that. What we did when somebody got hurt, we basically either on either side, by the way, we also, uh, there were also times when we were uh, called on to evacuate, um, Palestinians, people from Lebanon who got hurt, stuff like that. So basically we get called on whenever someone gets hurt, we get called on to, to go in and get them outside of the fire line and into, and back into the hospital, wherever that will be. So there is something very fulfilling about that being kind of like uh, part of the link of, of the people who create that mission to save lives. So that's kind of like the, the best I can tell. It's not a really uh, glamorous combat story, but that's kind of like at least the the uh, the feeling that I that I came out of after I finished my service. That is incredible. Um, wish wish there were more people like you in this world. That's very admirable and uh, just really really cool. I I would love to be able to do something like that, and hopefully I still can in this lifetime. Um, let's jump right into it though. 99 Bitcoins, that sure. is your baby. That is your company. You started out as a blog and now gets millions of readers every single month. I guess before we jump into that, you started making YouTube videos on Bitcoin using like the sketch technology that everyone sees today. You started this back in 2013. Like what, what was going on in, in your noggin that, that said, I should start making YouTube videos and I should get into Bitcoin in 2013 well before everyone else. And I should dumb it down and explain it to, you know, five-year-olds or grandmas, grandpas, whoever it may be. Like what was going on up there? Yeah. So that's, that's a pretty interesting story because back in 2013, I was out of a job. I was basically sitting at home playing, um, playing online poker. <laughs> that's what I was doing most of the time. Uh, and then I stumbled upon, uh, this, uh, article on TechCrunch saying this, Anonymous currency, uh, called Bitcoin just hit a billion market, uh, a billion dollars market cap. And I come from an, uh, internet marketing background. So immediately I said, okay, this is interesting. Maybe there's some sort of business model I can set up around this. Uh, and I started looking into Bitcoin and I always knew that my forte was taking complex stuff and dumbing it down into plain words. 
In this case, we, I took Bitcoin and tried to, you know, to explain it plain English. And initially, I had no idea what I was doing. It was basically an experiment. 99 Bitcoin started out as an experiment, totally just saying, let's just put something out there. I had no idea what Bitcoin was. I was in mainly for the money. I wasn't the Bitcoin evangelist I am today. Back then, I was just trying to, to get, you know, make a few quick bucks. And I used this, I think, a software called Paltoon. I don't even know if it's still around that you can do your own uh, sketch technology things. And, you know, I just started reading from a lot of sources uh, back then. Even Coindesk was just starting out. So there was a lot of, uh, it was very, very early days. It was around April 2013 when I, when I first saw that. And because there wasn't a lot of competition, because there were there were no blogs back then from, definitely not from marketers. There were all, a lot of tech blogs, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of, of geek jargon. But because there wasn't a lot of competition, relatively quickly, I managed to to make it to the first pages on Google on a lot of like major, major search terms, um, you know, like how to buy Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin, what is Bitcoin mining, stuff like that. And again, this was very early day. This was before the 2013 bubble uh, even happened. And ever since then, the site kind of like basically rode the, the, the Bitcoin wave. So in 2013, the late 2013 was a, a, a very big Bitcoin bubble where, you know, it went from around $50 to, two, to sorry, to $1,200 and then crashed back to $50. And at that time, the site basically exploded. The first time it exploded, I saw like the site explode with visitors because people were, were actively searching for it. Um, and then I knew that, that, that I was actually onto something because up until then, the first six months, I was just playing, you know, around with my spare time. And I said, okay, there's something here. I better look into this. I started learning a lot more about Bitcoin. I got very excited about it because this is the first time it was actually, once I started learning about it, initially I learned about it because I wanted, you know, just make more money from the site. It was, fu- it was funny, but once I actually started learning about it and I understand that I need to also understand what money is and how money is created, I got like super excited and said, oh my God, this is, this is life changing. So for me, Bitcoin wasn't life changing from day one. Um, I knew about Bitcoin when it was $70. But I didn't invest in it until it was a thousand dollars, something like that. I read that. You, you, you didn't get it until 2016, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 2014 is where I saw it first, but only 2016 I actually invested my money in it because up until then I didn't really understand it. Right. Uh, and there was a lot of like, you know, and, 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 I, and until I didn't really understand it, I was afraid to put, you know, my own money at risk. Um, but once I, something clicked and I, it was like an aha moment for me, it was life changing. The rest is history. I absolutely love that. Yeah. You are probably the perfect guest to give almost the intro to Bitcoin lecture for our listeners. And we've had a ton, ton of listeners who do want this intro to Bitcoin. So I'd love to focus for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so into that before we get into the history of it, because, and I do think that is a very important part. Obviously, when you're talking about the history of Bitcoin, you probably have to talk about the history of fiat and, you know, just history in general, yeah. monetary policy, so on and so forth. But exactly. before we get into the nitty gritty, can you just talk about, you know, what is Bitcoin, its its main properties and why it's it can become such a powerful tool in today's day and age? Well, that's a very true question because it's really hard to do that without uh, explaining what you just talked about, you know, without explaining the whole history, without explaining the, the, what is the problem? The, when I reach, if you take a look at any of our tutorials, what is Bitcoin, what is Ethereum, what is Monero, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. The first thing I try to, 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 to explain to someone is, let's see what's the problem we're addressing here. And if we talk about Bitcoin, we need to talk about a problem of, you know, of fiat money, of, of centralized currencies, of the fact that our money isn't, isn't owned by us. It's owned by the banks. It's owned by the government. It's created by the government. Um, and we have to give that, um, intro in order to understand why Bitcoin is such a game changer. What I am very happy that's happening today in these days, at least it's happening here where I live, is that people are starting to realize that without needing to explain it because cryptocurrency is getting so, um, so, you know, so major and everybody's trying to invest in it. And the banks here, at least where I live, they start blocking uh, transactions to, to Bitstamp, to Kraken, to Coinbase. They don't allow you to, to send money out. And, and moreover, they don't, they don't allow you to receive money that came from crypto. Yeah. And then people start saying like, hey, what do you mean I can't send this money out? This is my money. And then they start understanding that it's not their money. It's money that they gave to the bank for safekeeping and that there is no other form of money today aside from from money that isn't controlled by us. You know, there is cash, but cash all throughout the world is is being, you know, moving outside of circulation. Right. And this kind of like, you know, this 
this cuts the explanation I need to do in half. Because I can just, you know, people come I come to me and say, hey, I tried to move money to Bitstamp and the bank won't let me. How annoying. And I say, yeah, that's exactly why you need Bitcoin. You need money that isn't controlled by anyone. You need money. That's exactly what Bitcoin gives you. The the opportunity to, like, you know, like people say, be your own bank or, or have full control of your money. There's no other um, other type of currency in the world aside from gold, you know, and gold also or, or metals. But, you know, you have to carry them around. Here you have, you know, just a... A piece of, of 24 words, which is basically your your own bank. Right. So, so going back to what you you asked initially, it's hard to explain exactly what Bitcoin is uh, without um, without giving this intro. But to me, you know, there is a part of me saying the, the the old cliche that Bitcoin is is money that I fully control. And to me, Bitcoin is also a part of me sticking the finger back to the banks. So so that's kind of like the way I see it. That's my proactive way when I. One of the reasons I like to explain to people about Bitcoin, because I feel that I'm doing my small part in this, you know, monetary revolution that's happening. And I can see it happening in a lot of countries that, uh, you know, it started in 20, I don't remember when it was, I think it's back, it was 2016 in India, when they started banning the the large notes, the large cash notes. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, they made, um, they, they made people come in and exchange them. And there were these massive lines at the banks and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So when I was talking about that back then, people were saying, yeah, but that's in India. That doesn't happen here. And then you see it happen in another place, in another place. And, you know, and, and even here, um, you know, they started banning large cash transactions. And you see them shutting down bank, you know, ATMs and, you know, and all of these uh, bank branches one after the other. There's no way to actually access any, almost any, um, actual cash these days. So now it's much, much easier. There's not much uh, of a need to do the, uh, the explaining of the problem. And the solution of what Bitcoin is basically money that you control, that, that, that you have complete control over. That's the, that's the, the one liner that, that I use. Some people don't understand why I need money that I control. Why not use the bank? But. Um, but then we go back to the actual intro, what we talked about. It's it's tough for people to to really understand the importance of Bitcoin until you've been impacted by it. A lot of Indians, yes. a lot of Indians are understanding this due to the again the the large five hundred dollar and I believe thousand dollar banknotes, yeah, obviously, yeah, exactly. and rupees that are now gone. You have the Venezuelan currency that is you know absolutely toast. You have the Lebanese currency yeah. absolutely toast, and then. There's a currency that most people can relate to, and that is the U.S. dollar, where I believe something like 25% of all U.S. dollars in circulation have been printed in the last like 16 to 18 months. You know, yeah. Janet Yellen and the crew, Joe Biden, before it was Trump, doesn't matter who it was, but they just went over to the money printer, cranked the on button and started cranking, you know, obviously virtual dollar bills, but you get the point. The next point in the Bitcoin narrative that a lot of people should know about is the inflation aspect. I'd love if you could touch on how Bitcoin solves that problem. Yeah, so you just talked about you know, how the US dollar has been massively being printed in since the, the Corona virus basically spread out and, you know, all these stimulus checks that, you know, it's not just the US, it's also here in Israel uh, and probably, you know, across the globe, all of these um, uh, countries trying to, to deal with the, the unemployment and all of the things that the, the COVID brought to us. But Bitcoin is amazing because Bitcoin, you know, it, it doesn't care. It has a fixed supply. Every four years, that supply, basically, that new and the new supply of the currency cuts in half. Um, you know, we just have the, the last halving in 2020. So, do you want me to really kind of like go into the actual details of it, or you want me kind of like to, what 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 do you want to focus on here? Give, give me a high level. It, I'm tough. It's asked for, I'm asked for a high level, but low level. Like give give the necessary amount of details to paint the picture, but I don't want you to like make a okay. Van Gogh kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, sure. So so I'm gonna do it as 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 basic as as I can. So Bitcoin has you know a, a total max supply of 21 million bitcoins. That's all of the bitcoins that are, that are ever going to be generated. Now, new Bitcoins are generated roughly every 10 minutes when, you know, when a new block of transactions is being generated, new Bitcoins come into the system. We call that Bitcoin mining. I can go talk a lot about Bitcoin mining, but that's a really interesting subject, but I won't go into it. Um, the reason it's called mining because actually this is, I, I do want to touch about this. Bitcoin mining is one of the most confusing terms there is because the action of mining Bitcoins is only um, the after effect of the actual action being done. Let me explain. The main issue with Bitcoin is that you don't have a central bank to authorize transactions. Cause so you don't have a central authority to actually tell you which transaction came before uh, the, uh, what other transaction. And you need to find a way to, 
to have someone who actually authorizes transactions, but not give him the actual power to, to be, you know, like a central banker. So how do you do that? You kind of like randomize each time we'll pick another, uh, another person to be a banker. So you do it through some sort of like a lottery test. And I'm very, you know, this is a very uh, uh, rough generalization of how it works. No, you're, you're killing it. You're killing it. Keep going. So, so just imagine, so we say, hey, let's just do a lottery. And each, every 10 minutes, let's pick someone else randomly to, to be the banker. And now we have each time someone who can actually be the banker and decide on, uh, you know, the order of transactions, which transactions are approved or not. And on the other hand, we're not giving him too much of the, the power because each time we're going to pick someone else on some set of criteria, which I won't go into right now. This is the actual um, action being done in Bitcoin mining. It's the, I call it the who wants, who wants to be a banker contest. I like that. This is, this is Bitcoin mining. The thing is that the, the name Bitcoin mining is a bit misleading because once we chose the banker in some sort of random way, so to speak, he gets also a reward for being kind of like the, you know, like, like the, this, this, um, designated banker for the next 10 minutes. And that, that reward is the new bitcoins that are being generated by the system. And this, we kind of like, we're like mining them outside, out of the network. That's why it's called Bitcoin mining. Like you mine gold out of, out of the ground. So even though Bitcoin mining is the name given for the act of the reward, the actual action being done is that, the, you know, that this randomization of bankers, that choosing a different banker every time to control the blockchain, which is basically the whole transaction book of Bitcoin. So this was a bit of, a, you know, maybe a messy explanation, but uh, kind of like trying to talk about a bit about Bitcoin mining. So circling back to what we talked about, inflation, we have 21 million Bitcoins in total. And every 10 minutes, you know, another banker is chosen and, uh, a certain amount of bitcoins is being given to him as a reward. Now, this amount that's give, being given to him is being cut every four years. So it's going and it's gradually being reduced until in 2140, all of the bitcoins will be mined out of the system. All the 21s will be mined, but there won't be 21 million bitcoins because a lot of bitcoins that have been lost and can't be recovered. You know, people lost their wallets or send them to invalid addresses or whatever. So there's basically much less than 21 million bitcoins. And this is amazing because this is built in, this is hardcore in the system. You can't change this without a full consensus of everybody running the network, which is basically impossible by now to, to create because so many people are, are, are running Bitcoin uh, and are, are, are have a say in this network. So this is something that doesn't matter what, you know, what pandemic you will have, what w- war you'll have, this will stay fixed. And this is basically something that, that's for me truly amazing. It's an unchangeable or an immutable, as you would say, uh, financial system. That's a very good explanation of that. That was, that was bang on. Bitcoin is, I always look at, it, I'm a sports guy, just a very easy analogy that I use to my friends who are also sports guys or gals is it's like a professional sports team. You can't just make a team and plop it in the English Premier League or the NBA or the NFL. It, it doesn't work. There's only so many of them and people spend a lot of money for them. And that is similar to, Bitcoin, it is a scarce asset that is not growing on trees. It's not like the U.S. dollar that can be printed. Um, and and again, that is one of the reasons why Bitcoin is so powerful. That's more sort of on the store of value side and on the asset side. Yeah. Um, could you just give a very you know quick explanation of the Lightning Network and how that can be used to transform the sort of cross-border and just payment infrastructure that the world currently uses at the moment? It's fine. You're asking me very tough questions. I, I, I want to explain a bit how I go into, into every stuff, every, every topic that I, I break down. So I'm a very, um, regular guy, so to speak. I'm not this tech genius. You know, I have, I'm coming from a marketing background. Uh, I didn't know even what a hash was and all of these, you know, confusing terms in Bitcoin, um, that, that sometimes you, uh, people have. And whenever I take a new topic, for example, mining, lightning network, whatever you want, um, atomic swaps, what I do in the first like two weeks, I just sit down and I, I try to read and I try to find analogies, kind of like to, 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 or I try to find the best explainer I can to make it as simple as I can. And, and this process of actually diving deep into a topic is a process of like, let's say it takes me one month to build like this very good script of, of explaining something. And sometimes it's funny because if it's a very complex topic, I 
for that month, I get really deep into it. Let's say, um, what was it? Ah, Uniswap. I just did, uh, we just, uh, um, I wrote a script about Uniswap. It was very interesting. You know, all the DeFi. Great company, by the way. We can yeah. do a whole, oh, we can do a day long pod on Uniswap. Incredible. Folks at Uniswap, we love you. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> so it took me like a whole month to kind of like dig deep into, you know, DeFi indexes and what's the difference between a DEX and a traditional exchange and how traditional exchanges use order books and Uniswap uses, you know, the AMM algorithm, stuff like that. So, and it's really interesting. But sometimes what happens, because this is not my day to day, you know, I, I, today, by the way, currently I don't have any, I'm the owner of a company, but the company is run by very talented people, which, um, I just kind of, you know, have like a board meeting once every uh, month or two. And, and I'm less, uh, aside from doing these scripts, I'm less, I'm less, uh, you know, involved in today to day. So what can happen is sometimes I tend to forget what I wrote after like, you know, like two, three, six months, and I just go back to my videos and watch them <laughs> to understand it again. So that's kind of like just a, an interest. You know, you, you're, you're, you're throwing me to, to explain stuff, but sometimes I need to kind of remember, okay, what, what was it that I wrote back then? So let's go back to the Lightning Network. So coming back to Lightning Network, Bitcoin has, um, you know, there's, there's an issue with doing a decentralized uh, currency that is also very secure. I'm not going to go into that, but basically, what we talked about the the banker being able to approve transactions, so to speak, every ten minutes. That's you know that's very slow. If you want if you want to kind of like um, stop and also Bitcoin has also one some some sort of like let's talk about a scalability issue. So there's a, a limited amount of transactions you can approve each time. So if you want to do very small, very you know um, day to day transactions like buying a cup of coffee and paying back your friend for I don't know buying you lunch. Using Bitcoin is, isn't really a very good infrastructure for that. It's good for a store of value. It's good for long, large transactions, which you don't do very, very frequently. Um, but if you want to do these like few small, small cash payments, you know, paying for coffee and stuff like that, they need some other solution. So basically the Nightling network, if I'm trying to put it in layman terms and I'm, I'm making this up as I go, you know, it's like you and your friend sitting and watching uh, an NBA match. And you're start, starting to do side bets on, I don't know, how many shots is Steph Curry going to, to put in, for example, or how many fouls are going, fouls are going to be uh, given uh, to the team. And instead of, you know, let's say you bet on $10 and you win, and then you bet on another thing and you lose. Instead of just each time ex- exchanging the money, you just write down on a piece of paper, you know, how much, uh, who, who won and who lost. And in the end, you just, you know, you, you calculate the tab and you say, okay, in the end, calculating everything here, I owe you like $20. So this is kind of like the lighting network. It's like, it's kind of like a side bit. It's called side chain, right? It's, yeah. it's like kind of like a side bit. You, you don't, you don't actually send the transactions on the Bitcoin network. You kind of like, um, calculate with whoever you're transacting with all of the transactions. Then the total, whatever comes up to the total, you just send that to the network and you both agree on that because you know, you have a set of rules that you agreed on beforehand and it makes it much more easier to do very small transactions because all these small transactions, they don't go onto the network. They're calculated only by you two on that side bit that you have on that piece of paper. And once you finish doing all these calculations, you just send that, that subtotal to the network itself. So that's kind of like how I look at the, at the lightning. I like that. Tell me about sending Bitcoin to a friend. Let's say I, fly to Israel and you take me out for dinner and I want to repay you and I want to send you some Bitcoin. Walk me through that process with the Bitcoin address and everything else. Sure. So when I usually explain that, I I, I usually um, do the equivalent of carry to email. So when you want to send or receive Bitcoin, it's basically very similar to email. The first thing, when you, let's say you're going to, to explain to your grandma how to use email, the first thing you want to do is get her some sort of software that will be able to send and receive emails. It could be Gmail, it could be Outlook, whatever you want to use, but you need that software. You need that, that thing that, that kind of like can, can talk with emails. So the, th- the same thing here is the Bitcoin wallet. That's what's going to talk with the Bitcoins. That's what, what's going to, uh, you know, you can send Bitcoins to it, you can receive Bitcoin, send Bitcoins from it, you can receive Bitcoins to it. So the first thing you need to do is to get a Bitcoin wallet. You can either download that as an app to your, to your mobile phone or, or, you know, or, or download it to your computer or you can use a web wallet. There's a lot of different types. The same way there's a lot of different, um, email apps you can use. Once you download your Bitcoin wallet, you're going to need your Bitcoin address. Now, if again, I'm going to the email ana- analogy. I love it, by the way. That's, the, that, that's one of the best analogies I've heard. So keep going. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think it's very simple. It so, so 
if I want to send you an email, I'm going to need your email address. Uh, so, for example, your email address can be matt at cryptonews.com. The same thing, if I want to send you Bitcoins, I'm going to need your Bitcoin address. And the only difference here is that you don't choose your Bitcoin address. The wallet gives you that for you. So you just go into your wallet. It's a very ugly string of, of letters and numbers. You get your Bitcoin wallet, your, your Bitcoin address, and then you tell me, hey, this is my Bitcoin address. Please send it to me here. And then I can just send you Bitcoins from my wallet. So we talked about the kind of like the, you know, the software, which is the Bitcoin wallet. We talked about the address, which is the Bitcoin address. The only thing we're missing here if we're comparing this to email is your password. What's the password to actually access your email account? And in this case, it's a private key. So every wallet has a private key or in most modern wallets, we're talking about a seed, which is basically 2012 or 24, uh, 24 words, which this is the password to actually accessing your Bitcoins. Now, again, this is very overly simplifying things, you know, because uh, it's not as uh, as simple as it sounds, but that's kind of like how I explain people. I I tell them, look, this is your your email software, this this Bitcoin wallet you have. This is your email address, your Bitcoin address, and this this 24 words. This is your password. You can show this to anyone. Whoever sees this basically can even without your wallet. It's it's even you know it's worse than an email password. Even without having your your wallet, they can access your Bitcoins from wherever. So that's that's the the simplest analogy I use about explaining people how to send Bitcoins. That is a great one. And like I said, I've never heard the email analogy before. Um, it, you definitely don't want to take a gamble on that. And speaking of gambling, just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors at coinpoker.com. You guys have heard me talk about coin poker many times on this podcast. We absolutely love them. They are the revolutionary blockchain technology based platform that offers incredible, quick, fast transactions, instant and secure transactions on the blockchain for online poker and online sports betting. I personally love the mobile app with my phone out on the go and I can bet on some sports. I can play a couple of hands of Texas Hold'em, five card stud, you name it, they have it. Great team, like I said, quick, fast, instant and secure transactions. The in-game currency is USDT. They also have the fuel currency, which is CHP, that is CHP token. And they also offer Bitcoin, Ethereum, you name it, it is there. We love these guys, Coin Poker, appreciate you. And head on over to coinpoker.com to check them out. Afir, are you a poker player at all? Yes, I'm a, an aspiring poker player. <laughs> I did, you know, I play with my friends uh, once a week. You know, physically we meet and we play. Uh, it's, a, it's a very close group that we meet. Uh, I also used to play, like I talked, uh, online poker in, in my past, but I stopped that somewhere around <laughs> where I started 900 bitcoins. But I love that game. It's, 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 it has so many, so many analogies to real life. Yes. In, in a sense, that was just, which is amazing. It, it goes so deep. Uh, so I, I really love that game. Are there any other points you'd like to talk about on our sort of intro to Bitcoin that we haven't already touched on? No, I think uh, what I want to say, it, it's kind of like uh, it, it connects to what you were saying. If you want to get into Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, before you even put your first dollar in, just go and study. Now, the basic things would be to understand what is this currency, for example, what is Bitcoin? And ex- understanding how do I actually, you know, set, and, and what is this, like, like what is it, is it X factor? Why would I even use it? And the other two things which I would go into is the Bitcoin mining, like we talked about, and, and the wallets. So if you're new, if you're hearing this and you're new to cryptocurrency, just make sure to, to, you know, even go to our channel to and Bitcoins and watch these three videos. What is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin mining? And what is a Bitcoin wallet? That's the basics I would hope everybody would cover before even getting, you know, their first dollar into cryptocurrency. So that's kind of like what I want to say about that. Nice. And again, 99 Bitcoins, it's a free resource. It literally have everything you could ever imagine on the topic. When I first got into it, that was a great resource for me. I know a lot of people love them as well, and I highly recommend checking them out. One of my favorite sort of domains and aspects or products, if you will, it's not really a product, but you get what I'm talking about on 99 Bitcoins is the Bitcoin obituaries. And it is so funny how you guys do that. I'd love if you could just just give me the floor is yours. Tell me about Bitcoin obituaries and how did you think of that? Yeah, so actually I, I have to give the credit here. It's not to me because I didn't think about it. I was, uh, uh, the story is very interesting. Back in 2014, I met a guy named Jordan Tuwiner. I don't know if you know him. He's actually the owner of Buy Bitcoin Worldwide, which is also a very popular site. Um, and he was just starting out back then. And he was, he was the guy, guy who actually came up with this idea of Bitcoin obituaries. 
but he was still starting out and I saw this and I was like, oh my God, this is a very good, this is a very good uh, uh, resource. And I actually bought it from him back then. And back then there was like uh, 70 or 80 obituaries, I think. Uh, we're talking about 2015, 2014, I don't remember the exact year. And I started curating them from, from that day on. So I, I, he kind of like passed the torch to me and, and, and I started receiving, you know, this is completely community based. We don't go and actively look for obituaries. This is completely community based. The community sends them to us. We just read through the articles and try to make sure that, you know, they're actual obituaries and not just clickbait, and, clickbait in the title, because that happens a lot. But, um, it's, it's so satisfying when you actually find an obituary. Um, because, you know, you know that this thing is, is already is a very, um, credible resource in the community. It's going to be here, stay here forever. You know, it's the same people who said that the internet is a place for criminals and money launderers. It, these are the same people who are now saying that Bitcoin is, is, is basically going to fail and, you know, this money is going to be worthless and this is going to stay here for the next, I don't know how, how long, how many decades. Um, so that's kind of like the story of Bitcoin obituaries. I'm very happy that we have some sort of contribution to the, the community in a sense that, you know, this is, this is people recognize that, you know, if they see some sort of obituary, they immediately either they tag us on Twitter or just go to the site and send it over. And it's also very fun, you know, reading, reading this stuff and seeing how people actually resist change. It doesn't matter, you know, if, you know, it hits you in the face, they won't understand that this change is, is here and it's going to happen. And, and it's amazing how history repeats itself each time with something else. So, you know, back then it was the internet, now it's Bitcoin. Uh, you had the same thing going on with the personal computer that people thought that, you know, there won't be a need for a personal computer for, in every home. Uh, the cars, every, it, it just repeats itself every time. It goes, the show goes on as it always does. Yeah. This is, uh, this has been awesome. I do have a couple more questions before we wrap up here. A couple rapid fire questions. Tell our guests who Satoshi is and who is your guest? Who is your best guest on Satoshi? Who do you think he is? Um, I didn't do it. Like I said, I didn't do that much of a research on it. The one thing I saw, I don't remember why, where I saw that. I think it was barely sociable. Could be that he did. A, I think he did a, an, an episode on who is Satoshi and he talked about how Adam Beck is, uh, he thinks he, it is. That was pretty convincing, but I can't really say because, you know, I read a lot of the, of the history about, you know, Satoshi's writing and all of that. And, but I never tried to, uh, I, I actually played around with the idea of doing a, a Bitcoin whiteboard Tuesday about digging deep into trying to drill into the, into the, to the identity of him. But right now that was pretty convincing to me, the, the one that he did. Hopefully, I really hope that nobody will ever find out who Satoshi is. Um, I think, I don't know if it will matter that much at this point, but I think, this is probably Bitcoin's greatest achievement that it managed to reach where it is today without actually knowing who ever invented it. Who do you think some of the most important stakeholders and not influencers, I hate the word influencer, but who do you think are some of the most important people and organizations within the Bitcoin community at the moment? Well, define to me what you what you consider as important because, you know, it can go either way. Um, I really, really, I think Andreas, you know, it, it goes without saying, but I think the job that Andreas did for this, for Bitcoin is, you know, it can't be exaggerated enough. First of all, the um, patience he has to go and explain everything from the beginning each time, you know, without being uh, very arrogant about it without being impatient. It's just, you know, it's so inspiring to me as someone who's also trying to educate people. He's, he's been one of my role models for a long, long time. Aside from that, um, you know, we can talk about important stuff and like you said, influencers, but you know, I don't want to, I think we can talk about, you know, the Coinbase and the Bitstamps and, and all of these people and Brian Armstrong who, uh, and the Winklevoss twins and, and all of that. But I think to me, the people who I really get inspiration from are the YouTubers. Um, the YouTubers who day to day go and put out these shows and I'm talking about Altcoin Daily and I'm talking about Bitboy Crypto and all these people who, um, and BTC Sessions, uh, and Crypto Zero. So you have all these YouTubers who just go out and do the work, you know, uh, they're down there in the ditches, was bringing people the information, breaking it down, explaining it to them, giving them credible information, not hype, which is very, very important to me. So these are the people who I, who I look up to when I try to, to measure myself up, measure myself up against. Well said, very well said. Um, couple quick rapid fire questions here before we wrap up. 
Bitcoin at 100K, when and if will this happen? This will definitely happen. It's not a question of, of uh, if, it's a question of when. Um, when, I think we will see that um, either by the end of this year or the beginning of uh, 2020. That's, I, I'm going to take a risk here and say by the end of 2021. I completely agree. Uh, I can, especially with the recent setback, completely agree, 100%. Yeah, exactly. I, now, I, I, but actually, I actually tweeted uh, something very interesting today. Um, this is the first correction that happened that I have more people asking me, how can I buy than telling me, oh, Bitcoin is dead. Exact same. People were asking me, did you buy the dip? Should I buy the dip? And it, normally it was, exactly. normally it was, hey, I told you so, Bitcoin's going to take a shit. And now it is, exactly. when can I buy? And is it a good time? So you're bang on there. It's crazy. Exactly. The, uh, every, every time we go through one of these huge setbacks, it only makes the community stronger and takes out the bad actors and stakeholders that were not wanted there in the first place. Um, Alfir, this has been incredible. I, I really did learn a lot and I know our guests are going to absolutely love this episode. Are there any other resources or, or any other YouTubers besides yourself and the 99 Bitcoin fam that would, uh, that, that you would recommend for our guests to check out? Yeah. Uh, so I said, I think Altcoin Daily is a great resource, um, for, for news. Um, other than that, I forgot the guy's name. But uh, I need, I, let me, let me check that for a second because I think he, 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 he should receive some credit here. Uh, the guy talking about, uh, ah, cinematics, I think yes, his name he's is. He's great. He, so he does, he does the sketches. Yeah. So he does a lot of the, yeah, the DeFi videos. He's very good at, at breaking down the DeFi videos. That's also, uh, someone I think, uh, I'd, uh, I'd really, you know, uh, recommend. And of course, you know, Andreas, I talked about it. There's not much more to say about yeah. that. Um, and last question, where can our guests find you and 99 Bitcoins on socials? So, uh, you know, we have 99bitcoins.com, which is our main website, which we have all of the text tutorials and we have our Twitter, which we're not that active on Twitter, I have to say, but uh, we're also there, but our, our main, um, channels are our website and our YouTube. So that's kind of like where we, where you can have the, uh, where you can find us there. You got it. Afir, thank you so much for jumping on. It was, uh, an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I learned a ton. Like I said, our guests learned a ton too. We just had a quick little disruption. Looks like you got a little baby in yeah. there. No worries about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> sorry you know, about that. Hey, don't be sorry. Perfect time to wrap up. Really appreciate having you on. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Hopefully we can do around two in the future. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed the time here. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, this was the Crypto News Podcast with Ophir from 99Bitcoins, a true Bitcoin veteran and crypto veteran. It was a treat speaking with him. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give us a subscribe. We would absolutely adore that. Again, we release Epis on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays every morning. Open up Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Overcast, you name it, and you will find the new episode locked and loaded in your account. We love you all. Hope you have a great day, phenomenal weekend, and uh, we will keep in touch. All the best and have a good one. Bye.